Okay, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of uh, the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and uh, we're really uh, delighted to have with us uh, this evening Professor uh, Matthew Delmont, who is uh, here to talk about his new book, Half American, the epic story of African Americans fighting World War II at home and abroad. Now, Matt's a, a history professor at, at Dartmouth College, and uh, and he's an expert on African-American history and the history of civil rights. Uh, he's taught World War II for, for more than a decade, uh, but researching this uh, latest book of his, he says, compelled him to see the war with fresh eyes. Nearly everything about the war, he writes in the introduction uh, of his book, uh, its start and end dates, the geography, military roles, home front, and international implications, um, nearly everything looks different when viewed from the African-American perspective. Uh, a lot of what black soldiers and, and civilians contributed to the war effort has tended to be overlooked in previous historical accounts. So uh, Matt's book fills a, a significant gap. And one thing he, he makes clear is that white and black experiences during the war uh, were quite different. Uh, even uh, their understanding of what the fight was about wasn't the same. Uh, while many white Americans saw the war as a single campaign for victory uh, against the Nazis and Japanese, uh, many black Americans embraced uh, what was called a, a double V slogan, uh, which stood for securing victory over not just fascis fascism abroad, but also over racism at home. Uh, as the war was being fought, many uh, black troops uh, uh, serving uh, key roles, and um, um, uh, many black tr troops served key roles and, and performed admirably on the battlefield. Uh, but, but at the same time, there were race riots and rebellions uh, here in the states. Uh, black Americans faced obstacles when applying for jobs and war factories, and black soldiers suffered abuse and violence. Uh, even after the war, little changed, with black veterans still subject to racial attacks and often denied benefits available to their white counterparts. Uh, Matt's narrative, as a reviewer in Kirkus said, is disturbing and painful, but it provides important pages that have been missing from American uh, history books. And a New York Times reviewer called Matt an energetic storyteller giving a vibrant sense of his subject in all of its dimensions. Now, in conversation with Matt this evening will be Thomas Guglielmo, uh, an associate professor of American studies at George Washington University. Uh, his most recent book, Divisions, uh, which came out last year, focused on uh, racism in the US military during World War II. So please join me in welcoming Matt Delmont and Tom Guglielmo. Is this on? Working? Yeah. Great. Well, I'm really happy to be here and to have the chance to speak about this really uh, terrific and important book, Half American, by Matt Delmont. Um, and uh, I thank everybody for being here. Um, so why don't we start, uh, why don't we begin at the beginning? Um, and I'd love to hear you chat a bit about how you ended up writing this book. You know, I know that you've written, I think this is your fifth book. Um, so Matt has written about busing, has written about American Bandstand, has written about uh, roots. Um, so World War II is, is something of a new topic, I guess. So how did you come upon, and I, you know, the introduction mentioned that you've been teaching World War II for a long time. So maybe that's the answer. But yeah, where did the genesis for this book come from? Thanks, Tom. And let me start by saying thank you for joining me in conversation tonight. And let me recommend Tom's book, Divisions, to everyone. Uh, it's a really excellent book. And one of the nice things about being a historian is that our work complements each other. And so it's really a pleasure to have a chance to talk with Tom. 
And thank you all for coming out. I know it's a beautiful night in DC this evening, so I appreciate you taking some time this evening. Um, so Tom, thanks for asking about how the book came about. So my last book project um, was a project on African-American newspapers called Black Quotidian, where I was looking through historical African-American newspapers to just try to get a sense of what day-to-day -day life was like in different black communities all across the country. And it was looking at these wartime era papers from Chicago, from Pittsburgh, from Cleveland. I kept coming across stories about black Americans who volunteered or were drafted into the army or navy. Um, these were just small kind of caption stories, small pictures and little write-ups of um, average folks. These weren't famous people like the Tuskegee Airmen, just average everyday African Americans. First I came across about a dozen of these and eventually hundreds of them. And it was those kind of daily slices of life of what African Americans were experiencing during the war that really kind of opened my eyes to how much more might be there. Literally just seeing all of these black Americans in their military uniforms was a, an aspect of the war I hadn't fully seen before. Um, as you mentioned, I, I've taught on this topic for more than a decade, but it was really that kind of high level overview that you usually see in a textbook. Um, I hadn't really paused and thought about what did this war look like for average black Americans in Chicago and in Los Angeles. And so that really inspired me to try to learn more about the topic. Um, so I dug into uh, archival sources, dug into uh, black newspapers to get a sense of what was going on there. And then one of the, the most important sources were um, oral history interviews. And so one of the first oral histories I came across was a gentleman named uh, Robert P. Madison, uh, who was a student at Howard University. Uh, he got drafted and paused his studies at Howard um, and joined the 92nd Infantry Division. And he earned a Purple Heart in combat in, in Italy. And he told the story. He was in his, his 80s when he gave the oral history interview. Um, it was with the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Um, he told us about going to a bookstore, probably not unlike this one, going to the section of books on World War II and taking out a big book off the shelf, flipping through it and finding nothing on black troops at all. Um, and what he said and what stuck with me was, uh, he said, we were a forgotten group of people. And that, that really inspired me to, to work on this project, the sense that more than a million black Americans served in the military during World War II. Um, but I think too often we don't tell the story of World War II from that perspective. And so that's what really motivated me to, to work on the book. That's great. Yeah, there was a Brent Staples uh, op-ed maybe 15 years ago kind of calling for precisely this book, kind of talking about, you know, blockbuster movies like um, Saving Private Ryan that have no black characters in them and kind of talking about the desperate need for a book precisely like this that really highlights the centrality of African Americans to America's World War II experience. Um, so let's let's talk about the book itself um, and, and kind of specifically some of your big arguments. Um, I, 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 one of my favorite history quotes is uh, from Ralph Ellison, the famous writer Ralph Ellison, who said, history speaks even when no one wills to listen. History speaks even when no one wills to listen. And so I'd love to hear you kind of talk a bit about what you see as the kind of most urgent arguments of the book and how those arguments speak uh, to this day, speak at this very moment, even if we're living 70 plus years after the fact. I think one of the most important pieces from the book that I think speaks to the present is that for black Americans in World War II and other time periods as well, uh, patriotism and dissent went hand in hand. I think that can't be said often enough that for that whole generation of black veterans, they fought during the war. They, they very much wanted to win the military aspect of the war, but then they came home and immediately started fighting for civil rights. Um, they wanted America, they were fighting for a better version of America. And so I think we're at a time period right now where politically it seems that one can't be both patriotic and also be dissenting from many aspects of American policies. And so World War II gives us a, a time period to understand and gives us a host of different um, veterans and characters to understand that patriotism and dissent have gone hand in hand, that fighting for one's country can also mean calling for it to be a better, better version of itself, trying to make freedom and democracy actually um, be true here on the home front, uh, not just something that was happening abroad. Then the other piece, um, we're living in an era with uh, fascism in the news constantly. Um, and I think one of the most powerful stories from um, the black perspective of World War II was that the war really started before Pearl Harbor for most black Americans. If you were to pick up a black newspaper from 1933, 34, 35, you'd see extensive coverage of what was happening in Europe. Um, black Americans were among the first to really recognize the dire threat that Hitler posed to the world. Um, they recognized that Hitler was drawing on America and the Jim Crow policies of the South as justification for his treatment of Jews in Europe and the kind of racial ideologies that he and the Nazis were trying to bring to, bring to the uh, foreground. And black newspapers weren't afraid to call it out as such. Uh, there was no beating around the bush when you look at black newspapers at the time. They were explicit in saying, this is racist, this is fascist, this is a white supremacist vision that's not just in the US, but it's true internationally as well. 
Uh, fast forward a couple of years with the Italian invasion of Ethiopia and Spanish Civil War, that sense that fascism was not just a European problem, but was a problem that was going to reach American shores uh, eventually, and more quickly than people would realize, that came through most clearly in black newspapers. So I think today when there are serious concerns about authoritarian regimes, both here and elsewhere, um, I think we can look back to the past and understand how a previous generation of Americans fought back against that. Great. Um, in the intro, you mentioned the greatest generation and the need to train. I think the line is you, we need to train our lens on the greatest generation. And so, and I'm sure uh, everybody in the audience has heard this phrase. Um, I think for ordinary people, this is kind of the way they understand the World War II period. Um, and so I'd love to hear you just kind of reflect on how you see your book engaging with that phrase um, and in in particular you know do you is this is the book uh, an effort to kind of expand our understanding of who counts as the greatest generation or is this a kind of a more fundamental challenge to the very notion of a greatest generation a kind of a a more kind of um, frontal attack on that very idea I think it might be both, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, I think that concept of the greatest generation is probably always going to be with us. Uh, it comes out of Tom Brokaw's book. And what's funny, I actually went back and looked at Tom Brokaw's book when I was working on this, and that book's actually more complicated than the, the shorthand greatest generation would lead us to think, that he talks about black veterans, he talks about Japanese Americans who were, who were interned. Um, but I think that shorthand of greatest generation has really gotten boiled down to a very simplistic view of what the war was about, uh, almost always focuses on the experiences only of white Americans, and focuses on uh, an idea of national unity to suggest that somehow the country was um, fully united behind the war effort and that there weren't divisions during, during the World War II era. We know as historians and as folks who pay attention to history and follow the news that that's not true. Historically, if you look at the evidence, there was deep racial divisions during, during the war era. And so I hope my book in part does expand that concept of who counts as the greatest generation. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the reviews in the New York Times used that phrase, the greatest generation, to talk about the book. And, that, and if we're going to talk about greatest generation, we have to talk about black Americans of that era, right? What it means to fight for a country that, as James Thompson said, treats you as half American. Mm -hmm. To fight for a country where you don't yet have full citizenship, but to, to fight and to die for that country, and then to come home and demand that it be a better place, uh, is a profound vision of what America could be. And it's a profound bit belief in, in the power of, of, um, of civil rights activism. And so I, I do, if, since I don't think that idea of the greatest generation is going anywhere, um, mm -hmm. I do hope the book expands it in some way. But I do think also, more fundamentally, I hope it challenged us to uh, think in a more nuanced way than that, mm -hmm. that term would lead us to believe. Um, and particularly when you actually get to the, to the root of this, that whole generation of, of white Americans, it's you can't simplify something when you're talking about millions and millions of people. Um, but it came back at the end of the war to a country where racial apartheid was still condoned and sanctioned throughout the entire US South, and where other forms of racial discrimination were still true in other parts of the country. Um, that's, that's a troubling view of what it meant to, to be an American, to belong in this country in that mm -hmm. time period. Um, and I think it was generations that were still fighting, fighting those battles about actually addressing uh, the legacies of racism in, in our country. Um, I think the final piece I'd say in this is there have been a, all sorts of debates in the last several years about what it means to, to teach and write about American history. And a lot of it's gotten focused on the history of slavery, right? The 1619 Project and other works there, which makes a, a huge amount of sense. So you can't talk about American history without talking about the history of slavery. But I think part of the reason I referenced we have to train our eyes on the greatest generation is it's too easy to think World War II was somehow not complicated or not fraught with these same politics. Mm -hmm. We actually get into that history, it's just as fraught as the history of slavery, it's just in different ways. It looks different, but it's just, just as fraught. And so I hope um, readers of the book will come away with that perspective of this is a really fascinating, complex, and challenging time period that we need to, um, we need to reckon with honestly. Um, so I, I, one of the things I really like about this book is it kind of forces us to have a, um, a broader sense of what soldiering means, you know? Um, I think if you get your sense of what soldiering looks like from pop culture, um, you'd assume everybody is a frontline soldier. You know, everybody's in combat all the time. 
Um, and that just wasn't the case. You know, roughly 10% of American service members in World War II saw extended combat, 10%, you know, and yet they get, you know, 95% of pop culture attention, you know. Um, and one of the things I really like about Matt's book is he, uh, because of the way the military kind of, um, you know, assign black troops disproportionately to service roles, you end up focusing a lot on those uh, service roles and the importance of those kind of forgotten service roles, the folks who were um, driving trucks and, you know, moving munitions and, and uh, building, uh, you know, air bases and, and uh, clearing forests and all of this kind of stuff, this kind of unsung um, uh, but essential, um, 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 you know, form of participation in the military. This is a kind of a key part of the book. Um, so can you say a little bit more about what were called rear echelon troops? I don't know if they use that term anymore, but that was a term that they used during World War II. Um, um, can you say a bit more about those troops and how African Americans kind of figure into that really important story? Yeah. And I think this is one of the reasons it's been easy to write black Americans out of the history of the war, that when you focus only on the frontline troops, the platoons who are storming beaches and at the front line of combat, that means you're focusing almost exclusively on, on white troops just by definition. Um, and the hope, my hope is that the key um, contribution that the book makes in terms of military history is that World War II wasn't just a battle of strategy and will, but it was a battle of supply. And if we take that broader perspective, we can really see the contributions that black Americans made to the war effort, that they were absolutely vital to helping America and the Allies win the war. Um, to give a couple examples, within the Navy, um, at the start of the war, black Americans were only allowed to participate as mess attendants, where they essentially waited on and served white officers. But we actually get into these combat situations, if you're a mess attendant on a Navy ship or a submarine and a battle starts, if Nazi submarines are starting to shoot torpedoes at your ship, you're in combat, even if you're not technically in combat. Um, think about the Battle of Pearl Harbor, uh, Doris Miller, the mess attendant from Waco, Texas, was one of the most famous black Americans in the war because even though he wasn't trained on the ship's uh, guns, as soon as the battle broke out, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, he goes above board and starts to fire at these Japanese planes that are attacking the ship. There are other examples of other black men who performed similarly bravely uh, in combat later in the war or who lost their lives because they were on these ships that were in combat. In the Army, um, I think the best example would be after D-Day. Um, so D-Day, as many of you probably know, just stood for Day of the Invasion. There was still D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two, and for weeks and months thereafter, the Allies had to ship all sorts of uh, materials across the channel and then move those uh, war goods across France to keep up with um, General Bradley and General Patton's armies as they're pushing into to Germany. It was largely black troops that moved all of those war materials. Um, they were there in the ports across the channel, um, loading and lo unloading ships. They were there receiving the goods at Normandy and at the Cherbourg port. And then there was a group of truck drivers called the Red Ball Express, who were primarily black truck drivers, who moved all of these goods across France and, and into Germany. It was something like 400,000 tons of ammunition, gasoline, food, and other supplies that they moved uh, all across Germany. Um, one of the funniest moments for me of working on the book was I was reading things I never thought I'd be reading. And so I was reading about the number of, of horses that Germany had in their, in their military, that we sometimes think of Germany as being the, the more militarily advanced force during the war, the, the Blitzkrieg and the Lightning Warfare. But it actually, it was the opposite, that they had way more uh, horses and they had uh, tr trucks to be able to move goods. And so these Red Ball Express truck drivers were the ones who enabled America and the Allies to be the most mobile force during the war. It's what enabled America to really win the war you would almost never get that perspective of how the war was won from Saving Private Ryan or other Hollywood films. But military planners at the time understood that without the contributions of black Americans, the army couldn't move, shoot, or eat. Like Everything passed through the hands of at least one black soldier. And I think that's a really important perspective on what it meant to, to fight and win this war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, again, I think this is a really important part of the book. Um, Double V. So this is uh, something that was mentioned in the introduction. Um, so, and this is kind of double victory is a really important framework for your book, and it's a really important framework for many scholars in World War II. And this is the idea again that African Americans believe deeply in two victories, not one: victory over racism, over fascism, uh, overseas, and over racism at home. Um, and um, you know, as we kind of talked a little bit about, you know. Uh, um, you know, African-American communities were kind of, 
were divided. You know, America was divided, but also African and com American communities were not of one mind when it came to this war. Um, and so um, I I'd love to hear you just kind of chat a bit about that, about, you know, was to, to what extent were African Americans kind of debating this double V? To what extent were there debates about, okay, well, which, yeah, both victories are important, but is there one that should take precedent? Um, you know, can you take us into kind of African American communities and their kind of, you know, struggle to kind of make sense of fighting a war supposedly for four freedoms in a country that was so, you know, deeply racist and undemocratic? Yeah. Thanks for asking about that, Tom. Um, so the title of the book actually comes from a letter that James Thompson wrote to the Pittsburgh Courier. Uh, James Thompson was a 26 year old from Wichita, Kansas, and he wrote this really searching letter to the Courier which he asks, should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Is the America I know worth defending? And that, the reason I chose that for the title of the book is that really stuck with me. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Thompson is writing in December 1941 after the bombing, bombing of Pearl Harbor, and so he knows he's gonna get drafted. And so he's asking what does it mean for him and other black Americans to get drafted into a country that doesn't treat him as an equal citizen? Thompson ends up accepting his draft notice and serving in the military. Um, but as Tom, as you mentioned, Black Americans answer that question in thousands of different ways. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? For hundreds, if not thousands of black Americans, they see the war as something that they want no part of um, because they are, are deeply skeptical of America's um, commitment to democracy because they all they have to do is look around, right? look around a city like Washington DC, look around the South, look around Los Angeles, and they see that the things America claims to be fighting for are not true in the day-to-day -day lives of black Americans. Um, some black Americans take the courageous step of refusing their, their draft orders. Um, there's a guy named Lewis Jones, who's a student at Morehouse College, who refuses his draft order and has to go to jail for it. Um, and it becomes a, a real topic of debate within the black press. The Baltimore African American editors are explicitly trying to get him to, to rethink this because they're worried how it's going to reflect on the rest of the black community. Right. Um, but he's an inspiration to many other black Americans who are his, his age. Um, Bayard Rustin, who you might well known as a very important civil rights leader who goes on to help plan and, and really kind of mastermind the March on Washington in 1963. He spends years in a federal penitentiary um, because he's a, a pacifist and he refuses to, to join the war effort. Um, those are just a couple of the folks I cite in the book. And, it, yeah. and it's one of those things, you know, as an author, you have to make choices about where to put your emphasis. And so there are excellent books, I think yours is one of them, that goes into much more detail on the, the really r dynamic range of uh, political opinions that black Americans had about the war um, and how many folks just um, were deeply skeptical about about America's commitment, but also about America partnering with allies who had a commitment to, coloni to the maintenance of colonization, right? And that, that they, it was not clear that Britain or France were any more interested in democracy than the U.S. was. Um, and ultimately, within my book, those end up being a, a relatively smaller portion of the overall story. Um, and why I end up choosing to use Double Victory as a, a framework, um, because I, I think to my mind, it's even more powerful today than it was during the World War II era. I think once it becomes clear that the real horrors of Nazi Germany, um, I think that sense of uh, achieving victory or fascism abroad becomes even more powerful. Um, and I think now with the benefit of 70 years hindsight, the sense that that victory over fascism is, is an ongoing one, that just because military battles are won, that uh, tendency towards authoritarianism and fascism is never fully put to rest and has to be continually fought. But then I think the, the battle on the home front, um, I think almost a person, black Americans would have said, the battle on the home front was more important than the military battle because it was the one that impacted their day-to-day -day lives. But I think taking those two pieces together, taking the military aspect seriously, hopefully forces us to see black Americans as vital to World War II, mm -hmm. right? I think World War II is always gonna be one of the ways we talk about American identity, American belonging. And I wanna make sure we, we write black Americans back into that history of the war. But then taking the, the, um, the fight against racism at home part seriously too is that the way we typically teach history at the high school and even at the college level sometimes is to cordon off World War II from the civil rights movement. Right? We might make gestures to say the civil rights movement starts b well before World War II and World War II helps to, to fuel it. But still, when push comes to shove, we tend to focus more on the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s being somehow detached from World War II. I hope that by refocusing on that double victory I idea, that we can see that these were parallel intertwined battles that just went very kind of quickly from one to the next. And as one black veteran put it, they went from fighting in the European theater operations to the Southern theater operations. 
and so I think for me, uh, in recognizing some of those concerns that are there about the double active campaign, I still felt like it was a useful way to, to press even harder on uh, some of the ways of, of thinking about history we don't, um, don't talk about often enough. Great, great. Um, I, I have a, uh, I'm going to add a few more questions. And, yeah. and on this particular uh, question, I, I love this idea of, um, you know, seeing World War II, the history of World War II and the history of civil rights is deeply intertwined. Um, and, I, and, and so I want to give you a chance to talk a bit more about some of the examples you provide, especially of soldiers who are overseas fighting you know, explicitly against fascism, but also, you know, uh, deeply involved in civil rights struggle as well. Um, there are a number of stories, and I think some of them were in the Smithsonian Magazine as well. So could you say a little bit about, about you know, this, this, this argument, your really important argument you're making about the overlap between civil rights and World War II, and, and in particular, maybe some examples from, from American service members, African American service members? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm actually going to start with not a service member, but a famous civil rights icon. Uh, Thurgood Marshall is one of the key figures in the book, most well known as the first black Supreme Court justice. But during the war, he's the head of the NAACP's legal division. So he's traveling all across the country investigating cases of uh, discrimination and violence against black troops. Uh, and he's really doing amazing work to try to bring these cases to the foreground and really force military planners to uh, military officials to um, to address them and to make sure these aren't swept under the rug. So it was far too easy for the military to sweep these cases of violence uh, under the rug. Marshall is working alongside colleagues like Al Baker in the NAACP, who's the famous grassroots activist who helps uh, pioneer a mode of organizing that influences the student nonviolent or sorry the student um, student, yes. student nonviolent coordinating committee sorry yep. um, SNCC and then Black Lives Matter uh, decades later. What she does that's important is that. Contrary to military leaders who don't think black Americans have the ability to organize or to, to be leaders, she believes that any black American has the potential to be a leader. And so she's going to all these small towns in the South, um, working among sharecroppers and other um, local black folks to form uh, chapters of the NAACP. And so branch membership of the NAACP expands dramatically over the course of the war. And one of my favorite sources I found were um, black troops who were scattered in the Pacific theater and the European theater raising money within their military units to send back to the NAACP to fight for civil rights at home. And so these are in uh, L. Baker's papers at the Schomburg, that you have examples of them raising $90 here, $300 there, and sending it from Normandy back to the United States to fight for civil rights and voting rights. With Thurgood Marshall, the other thing he's doing while he's fighting for soldiers is uh, he's fighting voting rights campaigns. And so the Smith versus Allwright decision from 1944 helps to end the um, whites only primary um, in, in Texas. And so for Marshall, he understands that these battles are, are closely intertwined, the kind of treatment that black troops are going to receive and um, the ability to, vo to vote after the war. In terms of service members, the, uh, one of the best examples I think is Medgar Evers. Um, when he's 19, he's part of the Red Ball Express, this group of truck drivers I, I just described. He's loading uh, cargo for the Red Ball Express in Normandy. Um, he earns two bronze stars for his service there in, Nor in Normandy in, in, uh, in northern France. And he describes meeting French families there. And it was, to his telling, the first time he ever felt like a white person had treated him as an equal. Um, that his experience in France, the kind of reception he got there, was dramatically different than any anything he experienced in, in Mississippi. When he gets back after the war, uh, on his 21st birthday in 1946, he leads a group of black veterans who try to register to vote in Decatur, Mississippi only be turned away by a white mob with guns. And what he says later is that you know, he and other black veterans had been on the beach of Normandy and that they had fought for America, including Mississippi. And now, after the Japanese and Germans hadn't killed them, it looked as though white Mississippians would. Uh, Evers obviously takes on increasingly important roles in the NAACP in Mississippi throughout the 1950s. He helps investigate the lynching of Emmett Till until Evers is assassinated in 1963. Um, there's a whole generation of, of those um, uh, black veterans who take on really important roles in the civil rights movement, and it's almost impossible to imagine the movement's development and the energy it had without the role of, of those black veterans. Great, great. Yeah, why don't we open it up to questions from the audience? Yeah, we have a question. Can I ask you to go to the microphone? Um, right. Oh, we can't hear you. You want to take this? Um, then I don't have to go to the microphone. 
I was going to mention, are you familiar with the 442nd Regimental Combat Team? Um, I read about them, but maybe you could tell me more? Yeah. Uh, December 7th, 1941 uh, was when Pearl Harbor took place. And shortly after that, uh, our good American overlords uh, were so kind to our Japanese-American citizens that they put them in constant, oh, excuse me, internment camps, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, yet and still, despite all that wonderful treatment, there are a lot of Japanese-American citizens who wanted to fight on behalf of the Allies and the United States. Uh, my grandfather, who you have mentioned in your index, I just bought the book yesterday, so I mm -hmm. haven't gone in, into reading it yet, but uh, he was uh, assistant director of the Selective Service System, and he formed the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And what the overlords in our military did was to send them over to Italy. Now, you've heard of the White Cliffs of Dover, right? And that's the beachhead, kind of beachhead, that they got to be on. Uh, they fought up that beachhead, across Italy, across France, and through Germany. The, they are the most decorated military unit in the, our, the American military. Mm. And they're all Japanese Americans, okay? Um, I think that, you know, that part of the story isn't mentioned. When I see films about uh, World War II, you don't see Japanese Americans in there at all. Now, my grandfather got a, uh, two awards from the uh, Japanese American Citizens League uh, regarding his work in that context. So that was, you know, something I think that uh, would be interesting to, to note. And uh, while there's been a lot of uh, racism in the military since day one, and my grandfather volunteered uh, with a number of his fraternity brothers from Howard University, and uh, when they went down to enlist, what took place was that uh, they said, you know, what are we going to do with all these smart ass, uh, you know, and, and they set up the first officer candidate school for colored troops at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather, of course, was number one in his class, uh, that <laughs> <laughs> in his class there. But um, the thing that I think is uh, sort of missing is the overall context of that war. And uh, the fact that, uh, yes, indeed, blacks uh, were involved in it and were involved, uh, you know, in a very deep sense and weren't just uh, doing uh, uh, things like uh, truck stuff and bringing bodies out and this, that, and the other. But, uh, you know, the, my father was uh, in charge of military, uh, an MP, uh, not military police, I mean, uh, where a motor pool, and uh, he uh, was very active throughout the uh, war, and uh, he was uh, early on stationed in Germany. <laughs> stationed, he, you know, they took uh, some of Hitler's main people's uh, properties, and uh, he happened to have one of those. <laughs> but um, the thing is that there's a lot to that uh, in terms of nuances, and uh, you may be seeing before too terribly long a uh, book coming out that re you know, addresses Colonel Campbell Johnson, mm -hmm. who was my grandfather and uh, assistant director, and in fact, I think that, truth be told, he probably ended up integrating the armed forces. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, Grandpa was a pretty busy person, yeah. and uh, you know, and and D he was on active duty from World War One until he died in '68, and uh, 1968, and then uh, you know that's I don't want to go on and on, but I do uh, think that there are some perspectives on this war that are not being uh, you know recognized, and uh, the entire term 
of service from, let's say, let's just say from World War I through, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, I think, you know, we, we need to get a clear understanding about. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for appreciating. Sure. I appreciate how you connected that sort of national history to your own personal and family history. And so I really appreciate you sharing it. Um, I would recommend again Tom's book. I think Tom's book does the best job of any book I've read of, of connecting the multiracial history of the war, um, both the service among uh, different uh, communities of color, but also what it meant to um, different citizens, different communities of color on, on the home front, sort of the, that connection of Japanese American internment, but also the, the service of Jap Japanese Americans um, who so proudly served in the military. And then I think you're exactly right that trying to tell that whole history of um, black military history from uh, even before World War One all the way through uh, Vietnam and then beyond in the way in which black Americans have taken on an even larger role in America's military after it became a, an all-volunteer force. Do you want to just uh, maybe, I, I kind of, the question made me think, I didn't want to... Um uh, maybe finish this conversation without you having a chance to talk a little bit about black combat troops, though. I mean, the, the point that you kind of, yes, there's this great appreciation for the service troops, but there are obviously combat troops, too, so maybe you just want to say a bit about that as well. Yeah, um, in the later parts of the, of the book um, and the later parts of the war, uh, black Americans finally had the opportunity to participate in combat. And so the thing that blocked them from combat initially was that uh, American military planners had these very wrong-headed and racist assumptions about the, the bravery, courage, and intelligence of, of black troops. They were referring to an Army war report from uh, 1925 that ha used a bunch of racial pseudoscience to claim that black uh, troops would uh, not perform well well in combat. But uh, in the later aspects of the war, um, black Americans finally have a chance to participate in the Marines. And so there's a group of Marines that train at Monford Point who go on to play really important roles in the battles at Saipan and Iwo Jima. Um, within the Army, uh, there are two infantry uh, regiments as well as the uh, 761st uh, tank battalion called the Black Panther Tank Battalion, all of whom perform uh, extremely well in combat and um, a number of Medal, Honor, Medal of Honor winners eventually come out of those units. I think the most fascinating figure for me from the book in terms of combat troops was a, a man named Edward Allen Carter Jr., uh, who, because he's raised abroad, he speaks uh, German, Hindi, and French in addition to English. Um, he volunteers in the Spanish Civil War, so he's one of 80 black Americans who volunteer in the Spanish Civil War. So he has combat experience, he's multilingual, but when he volunteers for the army just before Pearl Harbor, they assign him to be a cook in a quartermaster unit, right? Because they have no idea what to, how to um, actually take advantage of the, the service of, of this, this man. He is uh, in this quartermaster unit through the majority of the war, but then finally in 1944, late 1944, when America needs more infantry troops, they finally put out a call for black Americans who are willing to volunteer to be in infantry units. Carter is one of those men who takes up that, that opportunity to volunteer and actually goes down in rank uh, to, to take on this role. He uh, performs just extraordinarily in combat. So I mean, for folks who are more into the kind of military history of the war, he is a, a warrior's warrior. He's in uh, combat with um, Nazis. They try to take him uh, as he's leading this um, small battalion across a, um, an open field. He ends up uh, killing two Nazi soldiers and capturing the other six. Uh, and he's awarded, uh, at the time, the Distinguished Service Cross, and then years later, uh, the Army in the 1990s uh, finally review a number of awards that were given during the war, and they promote him and seven, six others to uh, the Medal of Honor. And so I think his story I think, encapsulates just how poorly uh, the American military managed the, the manpower of, that black Americans had to contribute to the war effort, that there was no reason to have a segregated military. It made no sense strategically. Um, and, and again, I think your book nicely points out that military segregation was in, uh, extraordinarily complex. It, was, it required all of this logistical planning. It was redundant, and um, it was entirely counterproductive for a military that was trying to fight and win a global war. Uh, the only reason to do it was to appease white racial prejudice. And I think that the combat roles that black Americans eventually do take on both helps to show what they can do in combat, but then it helps to lay the foundation for the eventual desegregation of the military in 1948. Great, great. Other questions from the audience? I have a special interest in your book because my late father had served in Europe with the Army in World War II, and he had seen action for Normandy through the Battle of the Bulge and into Germany and Czechoslovakia. And I remember him telling me that there was an experiment in the midst of the Battle of the Bulge, because so many white GIs had been killed, that um, some of the um, infantry units, white infantry units, were integrated with black soldiers. And like you said, they had to 
those who, in fact, there were more who volunteered than they had slots available. And I was wondering if you go into that at all in your book. Thank you for asking about it. And thank you for connecting to your, your father's service. So that is very similar to what I was just, just describing, that it's at that moment in late 1944 when they finally issue this call for additional infantry troops that they finally accept um, black soldiers in combat. And what they do is they, they put them as um, separate companies within larger white companies. And so they are still fighting with black troops, but in larger uh, integrated units. Um, and it's important there that it's only after that performance that um, American military planners really recognize that black troops can succeed at a large scale in combat. The, the, um, the after action reports describe all of those troops as performing either above average or adequately in service, which earlier in the war, even groups like the Tuskegee Airmen, who I think are the most famous black troops in the war, they're disparaged by their white commanders. The kind of after action reports that they file say that uh, the Tuskegee Airmen don't have what it takes to be black fighter pilots. And so that, um, that it was really considered an experiment that uh, America wouldn't have taken that step if they didn't really need that, um, those reinforcements. But it helps to lay the foundation for the segregation of the military after the war and everything that comes after it. When the controversy over the naming of the local pro football team was in full force, I was surprised that the term red tails did not get more support. And I always understood that those were Tuskegee or other airmen who reconnoitered or bombed the Pulaski oil fields during World War II. Am I, am I right about that? Is, or is yeah, yeah, you are. So uh, for folks who don't know the reference, um, the Tuskegee airmen are often referred to by the short, short hand of, of red tails, um, in part because their, their planes had uh, that sort of red uh, symbol on, on the tail. Um, and it is a good question why it didn't get more steam well, in terms of the well, Washington football team. Cider is such a phony about the military <laughs> that I was just surprised it didn't get you know, more traction among you know, the local citizenry. Yeah. And I, think, I appreciate you asking that. We haven't had a chance to talk about Tuskegee yet, but um, I think Tuskegee Airmen are the most well-known figures in the book. And so what I hoped to do in the book was uh, offer some new information on, on that unit. And so uh, I try to talk about the larger world that got created at Tuskegee, because it wasn't just the pilots. There were dozens of black women who were nurses at the base. There were meteorologists. These are black folks who had uh, science and engineering training from MIT and other places. Uh, they were doing the weather reports. And obviously, as a pilot, you can't take off if you don't have a suitable weather report. And then there were hundreds and hundreds of, of ground mechanics that were there in Tuskegee, but then also went abroad uh, to do the, the ground maintenance and the airplane maintenance for the Tuskegee Airmen. And then for the airmen themselves, I try to talk about what their experiences were like on sort of a week by week basis. Because while they were doing everything they could to train to be able to be ready to fight for their country, to fight against these um, these Nazi Nazi planes, they were experiencing the same kind of horrific racism in Alabama as other black Americans were both within and beyond the military. And so I appreciate the question about the Tuskegee Airmen because the short version of it can lead us to think it was somehow um, a quicker, easy victory that they broke this barrier um, almost seamlessly. But we actually sort of look at how it played out over the course of the war. They had to fight week after week after week to just get the chance to participate in combat and then prove to their first to their commanders that they had what it took and then to the larger American public. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, uh, black newspapers reporting on the rise of fascism. Did their reporting include uh, uh, fascist activities in the U.S.? Thank you for asking. So they absolutely did. Um, and what I think was powerful about that reporting is they made some of the most explicit connections um, that I've ever seen for historical sources between international authoritarianism and fascism and what was going on in the US. Um, both the reporting, but also the editorial cartoons. They just so clearly called out the, the blatant hypocrisy of the US to be pointing at Hitler in Germany or Mussolini in Italy or Franco in, in, in Spain and saying that those were potentially dangers abroad while you had American politicians saying almost the exact same thing about white supremacy in the US. Like, like, it's one of the things that it's too easy to overlook, but there were elected officials, um, James O. Eastland, Stennis, others, who on the floor of the Senate explicitly said that they believed that the white race was a superior race, that they were proud to have white blood in their veins, and they thought black soldiers, black Americans, were, were inferior. This, this wasn't um, just a handful of sort of isolated bigots somewhere, but these were sort of elected officials who were 
um, uh, among the most powerful um, members of, of Congress and of the Senate. And so black newspapers, I think, were, were so val valuable because they, they made those connections explicit. They said what we're seeing in Nazi Germany, what we're seeing in, um, in Mussolini's Italy, what we're seeing in Spain, that's not a uniquely European problem, that these are all, what they kept saying was these are two sides of the same coin, right? Nazi Germany and the Jim Crow South are two sides of the same coin. Um, and I think looking forward to where we've been recently, for me, the January 6th and insurrection, um, seeing those images of people carrying a uh, Confederate flag and the Nazi swastika together, right? The pairing of those symbols wasn't a surprise to black Americans during World War II, right? They understood that those symbols had deep, deep resonances. Uh, and I think it was important for black newspapers at the time to call them out. I think it's important for us today to see those connections and, and not be surprised by them. Um, I have a question, sort of going off of what you talked about with the linking of the symbols, um, of the fascist symbols. Um, and I guess there, it, it reminds me of, there's an exhibit at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC right now about um, American, like how stories of Nazi Germany entered the American zeitgeist during the time of the war and how it wasn't until very late that Americans started to pay attention to the atrocities. And it's really interesting to hear what you're saying about how black newspapers were actually at the forefront of that criticism and that reporting. Um, and, and when you mentioned like black Americans coming home from the war, there is the ongoing civil rights movement, of course, there's a complicated but, but close history of, of, of American Jews getting involved in the civil rights movement. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit, I'm sure there is an entire book to be written here, about the relationship between American Jews and black Americans during the war itself, not just you know around the sides of it, which I think is what most people know more about. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking about that. So I haven't had a chance to see the exhibit, but um, there's a project called History Unfolded that mm -hmm. sort of did the groundwork for the project that um, I had a chance to participate with, and we did a bunch of research on black newspapers and how they covered the development of the Holocaust in the 1930s. Um, it's a tremendous, tremendous um, project. I think it does help to reveal how different American communities all across the country uh, understood uh, what was transpiring in Europe. Um, so I think in terms of uh, collaborations during the war, um, I think you start to see some of the first um, civil rights collaborations between Jewish Americans and African Americans during the war. Um, and what your question makes me think of is that one of the things I was surprised by is that when you actually get into the sources and see the kind of public polling that was going on and the interviews that were going on with average white Americans who were not Jewish about what was the war about, like why was America fighting the war, I was surprised by how many average white Americans were just like, I don't know. Right. Or, like, or their answer was, we want revenge against the Japanese, but like, why are we fighting Germans? Like, I don't know. Um, which struck me because retrospectively, right, once the, the true horrors of the Holocaust become apparent, it's easy to write that history back onto the war and say, well, obviously, America got involved because they wanted to, to defeat Hitler because of what was going on at the Holocaust. We know that's not true. Right? We, we know that America did not get into the war to, to defeat Hitler. But so your question makes me think, or what I would share is that, it was really only Jewish Americans and black Americans who understood what was actually going on mm -hmm. in Nazi Germany, I think, by and large. Yeah. Right? That they understood the, the, true, um, the true danger that was both unfolding them, but also the larger danger of that, that racial worldview. Um, and it led to the, some of the first significant collaborations between the two groups then expand after the war. But also, I think it gives us a, a perspective to ask very serious and pressing questions about what other Americans thought the war was about. Because it, 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 it wasn't clear to most average Americans why they were fighting the war. And they said so at the time. Like the public polling by Gallup and by like Time and Life, like they consistently found that majorities of white Americans who were not Jewish didn't really understand what was, what was going on, why America was, was in the war. And so that's one of the pieces of, of the history that then can too easily get written out when you think about that kind of greatest generation mythology or the good war, that it becomes apparent after the fact what the war is about, and we try to write the history back on. But at the time, it's black Americans, Jewish Americans are among the only ones who really kind of get what, what's truly going on. But thank you for, thank for referencing. Thank you, yeah. I just picked up your book tonight, so I don't have it being answered to the question. Um, did your book also include information about atrocities against black troops by the Germans? Um, I. Don't go into any detail on, on that. I'm aware of a couple examples of it, um, but I, I don't go into any great detail on it. Are there the ones that you have in mind? I was thinking in particular the 11 troops were killed by the Nazis in B Belgium, I believe it was. Yeah. Vern, I think it is. 
Yeah, yeah. So thank you for asking. So um, I make some references to the treatment of um, black POWs in um, in Nazi uh, Nazi camps, but I don't go into a great deal, amount of detail on on that. Okay, perfect. Other questions? I just want to make sure we give everyone a chance to. I'm a big fan of your last book on um, the coverage of desegregation uh, during, or the coverage of busing wars, basically. I'm just kind of curious. So there's a, there's a lot of controversy over race and how racism is taught in the schools, et cetera. So I'm kind of curious as to your assessment of how the press is covering this current moment post George Floyd, race wars, et cetera, um, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, et cetera. Thanks for asking. Thanks for the shout out to Wire Busting Tales. The, the so it, picture is oh, okay. Uh, Can you hear me better now? Okay, thanks. Um, so I, I would say at the outset, I think the media does have a, a difficult job, right? Because I think they're, they're trying to cover things that are rapidly evolving uh, and things for which there's they're often both conflicting information and conflicting viewpoints, right? Um, I, so not surprised, but I'm frustrated by the way that the last two years of coverage of, of racial justice movements and racial violence has played out. That I think that moment around George Floyd's murder and everything that came, particularly in the summer of 2020, was probably nearly unprecedented in terms of the level of attention to the, the long standing histories of racial violence in our country and to the, the present day realities of what that looked like in terms of um, particularly violence at the hands of the police and other white citizens. But the reason I'm frustrated is that the media has a tendency to get bored. Um, and so what happens in the civil rights era, which I focus most of my research on, is that you have a wave of coverage through the 1960s that focuses largely on the South, doesn't talk much about the North, right? But even then, by the late 1960s, the media gets bored and they, they say as much, right? They said, we've, we've covered the black movement, we've covered angry black folks in the streets, now we're going to turn our attention to the angry white folks. Right? I think a very thing, similar thing happened after George Floyd. Right? The, the media covered the story in a great amount of detail, but then by that fall, and certainly by the year after, the attention shifted elsewhere. Right? Let's talk about the, the Trump voters or whoever else felt like they were left out of those, those previous stories. Um, I think one of the things I take from having spent a lot of time working on, on black newspapers is there is really no such thing as objectivity when it comes to the media, right? Every, whether it's, whatever form of media it is, it, it has to have a point of view. And the black press was always clear about what its point of view was, right? It was fighting on behalf of black Americans, right? It, was, it called itself a fighting press. Um, people can take issue with that, but it was always clear what perspective you were getting. Um, I get frustrated with a lot of contemporary media now because it would claim to be objective and it would say, well, we're gonna report on what this person says and what that person says, and we've done our job if we cover, quote unquote, both sides of the issue there's not truly two sides in an issue like voting rights or truly both sides in an issue like uh, violence against black Americans or other commu uh, communities of color. Um, and I think the, the inability to move past that framework uh, leads, us, leads the media to continue to produce stories that don't ever truly get to the, the heart of what's going on, uh, but I think even worse can provide, um, can provide cover that allows people to think that things are somehow getting fixed when, when they're not getting fixed, when a lot of the underlying tensions, the structures are still are still there and in place. Um, and so maybe the, thing, the final thing I would say is that um, I think the opportunities for media today are, because the media landscape is more fractured, uh, I think there are possibilities for different forms of media to take on more of the legacy of what the black press did during its heyday. And obviously the black press is still very much around and with us. It's not in the same scale that it was in the 1950s, 1940s with the Defender and the, the Courier and others. But I think that that outlook about always being clear about what is it that you're that you're arguing for and about, um, I, I wish more media forums took that that kind of clarity of, of point of view to their to their reporting. Final questions. <laughs> I'm also kind of curious as to um, the relationship that the World War II veterans had to the country compared to other war, war veterans? Yeah. Thanks for asking about that. That probably is a good place to, to wrap up. Um, so this history might be familiar with you, but I, I think it's important just history to share um, still. 
the the GI Bill is probably the most important piece of legislation uh, in the 20th century in the U.S. Right? It's what made it possible for a whole generation of white American veterans to enter the middle class and then be able to uh, attain resources they were able to pass on to their uh, to their families and to future generations. By and large, black Americans were not able to benefit from the GI Bill at the same scale as, as white veterans were. Um, it's part of how, um, it's based on how the legislation was set up, that the politicians who worked on it, largely driven by Southern segregation senators, made sure that it was distributed at the local level, the state level, which everyone at the time understood meant was that uh, it was gonna be easy for those local branches to be able to discriminate against black veterans, and that's what happened. Um, that by 1950, 98% of the VA-backed Mortgages go to white veterans, only 2% to, to black veterans. Um, black veterans tell stories about being funneled into vocational programs rather than to four-year colleges, uh, being given the runaround. They try to get job trained um, job train through their, their local VA offices. And so time and time again, you heard these stories about black Americans being, uh, being discriminated against. Fast forward to the present, um, there's an institute uh, at Brandeis University. It's done some research on try to calculate what the long-term impact of that has been. And what they found is that on average, black Amer black were two veterans, uh, their benefits were only worth about 40% of what white veterans were. And that over a lifetime, that was about $100,000 difference. And so when you see the, the vast racial wealth gap in our country, um, a large chunk of that can be traced back to the GI Bill. Um, the last piece I'll mention though is I think it's easy sometimes to think that no black Americans were able to benefit from the GI Bill. And that's not actually true, that thousands of black Americans did benefit from the GI Bill. And what I think we can learn from that history is that those black Americans went on to do amazing things. Uh, so there's a woman named W. Johnson Roundtree, uh, who's in the Women's Army Corps. She uses the GI Bill to go to Howard University Law School, and then founds a really important um, uh, law firm right here in Washington, D.C., and wins very important civil rights cases in the 1950s and 60s. Um, Robert P. Madison, who I mentioned earlier, uses the GI Bill to get architectural degrees from Case Western and from Harvard, ends up founding a, a trailblazing architectural firm in Cleveland. And so I think it's important to recognize both the discrimination of the GI Bill, but also the fact that the black Americans who took advantage of it did tremendous things. And that I think there's an opportunity cost to the country that if more black Americans had been able to benefit from the GI Bill, we would have had a whole other generation of black professionals, uh, of lawyers, of engineers, of doctors, of architects, that we didn't have because not enough black Americans were able to benefit from the legislation. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Appreciate it.